The Little Round Top Fight, Part 3, Fight for the Hill. On this map, you see seven Confederate infantry regiments marked by small red rectangles. Law's five regiments are marked by blue text, and there are also two regiments from Robertson's Brigade, 4th and 5th Texas, and they're marked with black text. And you see five U.S. infantry regiments. To the south is the 2nd U.S. sharpshooters. And actually, this is only part of the 2nd U.S., maybe less than half of that regiment. The rest of the 2nd U.S. has gone north and rejoined Ward's Brigade. This part of the 2nd U.S. will hook up with Vincent's Brigade. And then up on Little Round Top are the four regiments from Vincent's Brigade, and note especially the 20th Maine on the left flank and the 16th Michigan on the right flank. Parts 1 and 2 of this video described how the attack began and followed it up to the point where Confederate infantry reached the saddle between Little Round Top and Big Round Top. And what you'll see in this video is attacks by two Confederate forces against Little Round Top. On the west side, it was the 4th and 5th Texas, with help from the 4th Alabama and 48th Alabama. And on the south side, it was the 15th Alabama and 47th Alabama. Maybe Colonel Powell, commander of the 5th Texas, commanded the two Texas regiments, but there was no overall command for the Confederate attack. Early on in these attacks, the colonels commanding both Texas regiments were wounded and forced to give up command. And soon the officers who took over command, lieutenant colonels, were also wounded and they were out of the fight, and from then on, both regiments were commanded by majors. And I'll start the animation here. Colonel Chamberlain, commander of the 20th Maine, was especially concerned with guarding his left flank, so Company B was sent downhill to the southeast as skirmishers. But before they could get into position, they ran into skirmishers from the Confederate infantry coming up the valley, and were pushed east and cut off from the regiment and they settled into a defensive position behind a rock wall. And note that this group from the 2nd U.S., the Sharpshooter Regiment, is headed for that same stone wall at the east end of the saddle, and that Oates's two Confederate regiments have stopped on the summit of Big Round Top. The consensus seems to be that the 4th and 5th Texas made two attacks with the 4th Alabama. The first attack was made immediately and beaten back immediately. Colonel Oates's two regiments on the summit of Big Round Top are exhausted after climbing to the top. It's possible that the 15th Alabama hadn't had water in several hours. Remember, their water detail had not returned when the charge started, and they could hear fighting in the valley in front of them. Oates apparently had no plans to move off the summit, but an aide from General Law arrived and ordered them forward, and down they went to join the fight. About the time that the 4th and 5th Texas and 4th Alabama made their second attack, Oates's two regiments arrive in the saddle between the two summits, and Oates is quoted as saying they met the most destructive fire I ever saw, unquote. Colonel Chamberlain, commander of the Union 20th Maine, said, They pushed up to within a dozen yards of us before the terrible effectiveness of our fire compelled them to break and take shelter, unquote. Oates's two regiments then made repeated attacks. James Woods, in his book, Gettysburg, July 2, The Ebb and Flow of Battle, documents four separate attacks up the hill by Oates's two regiments. And it may be that most of the work is being done by the 15th Alabama, but it's not clear. Over time, Oates shifts his regiments to the right. He's looking for the Federal flank. He wants to get around it and open the way into the rear, and, of course, Colonel Chamberlain knows that he has to prevent that. On the Confederate left, the 4th and 5th Texas fell back and reorganized for a second attack, and that was also beaten back. At some point in here, Union General Warren, up on the summit, was wounded, lightly, and heard the firing coming from Vincent's position, which he can't see from his spot on the hill. And General Warren realizes more troops are needed, he rides down off Little Round Top toward Wheatfield Road, looking for help. 
And guess who he runs into? General Warren was appointed as chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac in February. Before that, he was an infantry officer and commanded the 3rd Brigade of 5th Corps at Fredericksburg. That brigade is known to us at Gettysburg as Weed's Brigade. And what do you know? This is who Warren runs into. Weed's Brigade is marching south and west toward the fighting around the wheat field here. General Warren spots Colonel Patrick O'Rourke commanding the lead regiment in Weed's Brigade. It sounds like this must be very close to the same spot where Colonel Vincent met General Sykes's aide about an hour earlier. O'Rourke and Warren know each other from Warren's time commanding the brigade five months earlier. O'Rourke was leading his regiment past Little Round Top and heard shouting on the hill above him and sees General Warren and an aide, Lieutenant Roebling, riding toward him. Patty, give me a regiment. O'Rourke answered that Weed was up ahead and expected the brigade to follow him. Never mind that. Bring your regiment up here and I will take the responsibility. And at that point, O'Rourke was happy to agree. Lieutenant Roebling guided Colonel O'Rourke and his regiment, the 140th New York, up the hill. General Warren rode off to meet with the Corps Commander, General Sykes, and then on to find General Meade. Notice what's been happening on the west side of the hill. 4th and 5th Texas retreated from their second attack, and according to Norton, the 4th Alabama did not fall back, but hung on to their position until later on their ammunition ran out. But the 48th Alabama, which had been fighting at Devil's Den, moved up and joined the fight on the Confederate left. This was the third attack for the 4th and 5th Texas. And Harry Fans in his book, Gettysburg the Second Day, wrote, It was now or never, unquote. They attack one more time up the hill, and the 48th Alabama, by plan or not, slides around to the left, probing, feeling, looking for the flank, 16th Michigan is the regiment on the Union right flank, and Harry Fans described the situation like this. Both lines were nearly used up. Vincent's men had taken heavy casualties and were running low on ammunition. On the other side, the Texans were reaching the end of their rope, discipline was breaking down, and some of the 5th Texas advanced only a short distance before they turned around and returned to the cover of Round Top's woods. But, with the help of the 48th Alabama and perhaps others on the left, the Texas line pressed ahead, as suddenly success seemed within their grasp. The right of Vincent's line was crumbling. The colors were going back, unquote. It seems on the 16th Michigan side, someone's orders were misunderstood, and at least part of the regiment fell back. On the map, see the 48th Alabama slide around the flank, while Hazlitt's battery and the 140th New York, or Rourke's regiment, approach from the rear. About this time, Colonel Vincent was in the rear at the middle of his brigade, cheering them on, exposed, and was shot and mortally wounded. Colonel Rice took over command of Vincent's brigade and passed word up and down the line to the four regimental COs that he had taken over the brigade. He also sent a request for help to his corps commander, General Sykes, and we'll hear more about that later. The 140th New York climbed up Little Round Top in a column of fours, Colonel O'Rourke leading on horseback with an aide. Hazlitt's guns crossed their line of march. When Colonel O'Rourke reached the top, he and the aide dismounted, turned their horses over to the regiment's sergeant major, and O'Rourke led the regiment down the slope into the fighting. There was no time to deploy into a line. It sounds like the two lead companies stopped and loaded, while the rest of the regiment strung out to the right. There was an exchange of fire. The Confederate charge was beaten back, and Colonel O'Rourke was one of the men killed on the Union side. And you can see statues of him and General Warren on Little Round Top today. Fighting continued on the south end of the hill, and I mentioned before that Woods wrote that there were four separate attacks by Oates's regiments against Vincent's left flank. 
The most intense fighting seems to have been between the 15th Alabama and 20th Maine. At one point, Colonel Chamberlain, the 20th Maine commander, sent a message to the regiment on his right, the 83rd Pennsylvania, asking for help, but he was refused. The 83rd Pennsylvania had their hands full. But at least Chamberlain was confident that that flank was protected. The 83rd Pennsylvania couldn't send troops, but they seemed to be hanging on and protecting the 20th Maine's right flank. And it may have been at this point that out of desperation and a fear for his flank, Chamberlain stretched his line using a desperate tactic. See this diagram. Imagine a line of men like at the top of the drawing. According to Harry Fans, Chamberlain's command was to take intervals by the left flank, unquote, so that every second man in the regiment would step out of line and shift to the left. In my drawing, the new line is in black, made up of the men who stepped out and shifted left. Chamberlain refused the new line or changed the direction they were facing so that part of the line now faced east. The join might have started as a right angle, but it became a horseshoe and then a hairpin as it was forced back further and further. Chamberlain heard a roar of gunfire on his right, which might have been the 140th New York arriving and making their countercharge, which ended the fighting on that end. But the 15th Alabama kept up their attacks on the 20th Maine, constantly inching further out to the east, looking for the flank. The 15th Alabama forced Chamberlain's men uphill, and the 20th Maine counterattacked back down the hill, more than once. Colonel Oates later said that the 20th Maine counterattacked five times. There was hand-to-hand -hand fighting using bayonets, and the lines surged back and forth. Apparently a time came when both Colonel Chamberlain and Colonel Oates realized their men were at the breaking point. Chamberlain's men were out of ammunition, pillaging rifles and cartridges from dead soldiers on both sides of the line. Fans wrote that Colonel Oates believed his men were out of steam, and he requested help from the 4th Alabama. The messenger returned and said that he couldn't find the 4th Alabama, but there were U.S. troops in the woods behind them. And then two of Colonel Oates's company commanders both reported that the enemy was closing in on their right rear. Oates asked how many, and they were pointed out to him. It was Company B and the sharpshooters behind their stone wall about 200 yards away. So it seems both Oates and Chamberlain more or less at the same moment decided on a desperate step. Chamberlain decided to attack and Oates decided to retreat. And notice Fisher's brigade approaching from the north. I mentioned earlier that when Colonel Rice took over command of the brigade, he sent a request for help. That request got passed along to a division commander in 5th Corps, and the division commander sent one of his brigades, Fisher's brigade. On the Union side, Colonel Chamberlain has decided to attack, and there's controversy about exactly how this came about and who gets the credit. The plan was that the left flank should swing out and down the hill, and when it was parallel with the rest of the regiment, they would all sweep forward and downhill like this. And as fans described it, sweep the Confederates from their front or be destroyed in the attempt, unquote. On the Confederate side, Colonel Oates has decided to retreat. And as fans describes it, Colonel Oates sent his sergeant major along the line to tell the company commanders that they should not try to fall back in good order. Rather, at the signal, each man should run back in the direction whence they came, unquote, and the regiment would reform on the summit of Big Round Top. The 20th Maine charged, the two Alabama regiments retreated, and apparently at the same time, Fisher's Union Brigade arrived. And there was controversy later about how involved Fisher's Brigade was. Colonel Oates apparently described a long line of Federal infantry on his right, which might have been Fisher's men, but Company B and the sharpshooters were also in that area. Bradley Godfrey, in his book, Brigades of Gettysburg, spent several paragraphs describing different statements and concluded that Fisher's brigade was there, but arrived after Oates decided to retreat. 
Harry Fans says Fisher's men arrived in time to exchange parting shots with the rebels and, quote, in time to assure the Confederates that any further attacks on Little Round Top would be futile, unquote. The 20th Maine spent the night on the summit of Big Round Top, continuing to guard the left flank. The fight for Little Round Top was over. Little Round Top was a hard-fought battle. Casualties were high. My casualty statistics come from Philip Lano's book, Gettysburg Campaign Atlas. Colonel Vincent and Brigadier General Weed, the Union Brigade commanders, were both killed. Lieutenant Haslett, the commander of the artillery battery, was killed. Law's brigade suffered 28% casualties, and among Law's regiments, the 15th Alabama had 36% casualties. Robertson's brigade had 35% casualties, and the 5th Texas, one of Robertson's regiments, had 52% casualties. Vincent's brigade suffered 26% casualties. Among Vincent's regiments, the 20th Maine had 32%. After the Battle of Gettysburg, Colonel Chamberlain received a very severe wound in June 1864, was promoted to Major General, and was present when Lee surrendered at Appomattox. After the war, Chamberlain served four one-year terms as governor of the state of Maine. Colonel Oates was elected governor of the state of Alabama and served as a brigadier general in the U.S. Army in the Spanish-American War. Lieutenant Washington Roebling was an aide to General Warren at Gettysburg. He was the aide who, along with Colonel O'Rourke, led the 140th New York up Little Round Top. In 1865, he married General Warren's sister, Emily, who was also an engineer, and Roebling ended the war as a colonel and later, assisted by his wife, Emily Warren Roebling, supervised construction of the Brooklyn Bridge between 1869 and 1883. 